Um, I'm Ella. Oh, I'm being recorded. Okay. I'm Ella, and I am a third year PhD candidate at the City University of New York in the New York Botanical Garden. And I study Caribbean medicinal plants for women's health. And I am really um, pleased to be invited to this um, talk tonight. I think it's going to be really interesting to get the conversation going. So I kind of wanted to start it out, start out by introducing myself um, and kind of like how I became an ethnobotanist. So ethnobotany is the study of how people use plants. Um, and so I, you know, I feel like my first love was botany and I don't have a very unique botanist origin story. I feel like this is pretty similar if you talk to people who study plants, but I grew up in Northeast Georgia where this little star is um, uh, on Lake Lanier. And I spent so much time outside as a child with my parents and grandparents. We were always hiking. And so I knew I had this love of nature and plants growing up, but it wasn't really until high school that I kind of put two and two together and decided, okay, I really love this thing. How can I, how can I do this for the rest of my life? How can I do something with plants for the rest of my life? So I started volunteering at the local botanical garden in my hometown when I was in high school. And we actually did a lot of conservation work there. They had a special garden just for endangered plant species in Georgia. So I did a lot of work with pitcher plants, which I have here, picture of them. Um, and that was more like botany from the horticultural side. So I was building plant beds, working in the hot Georgia sun, you know, weeding, pruning, getting really getting my hands in the dirt and having my hands on the plants. And then a few years later, when it was time for me to go off to college, I, I went to the University of Georgia and I, I was a plant biology major which is different than horticulture, but, you know, I went in as plant biology and something I feel like I really appreciate about the program at UGA is they were very much like, okay, all plant biology undergrads, you got to do research. So pretty early on, they set me up with the University of Georgia herbarium, which an herbarium is kind of like a, um, a library of plant specimens where they're kind of mounted to paper like this as a record. And I worked with my mentor there and I started doing research for the first time and I kind of had an inkling that like I wanted to do you know do go into that side of things but that really solidified in my mind okay I want to be a scientist and I really like doing research so flash forward a few years a few years more and it came summer came around and I really wanted to do an internship and go out and do research somewhere else but that did not pan out <laughs> I got none of the internships I applied for um, and it ended up being kind of the best thing because I ended up you know, talking to these other professors who were doing kind of botany adjacent work at the um, at the University of Georgia. So I kind of had an, an inkling that I wanted to do ethnobotany just from kind of learning about it in my classes, but it wasn't quite sure. And I ended up working at the Latin American and Caribbean Ethnobotanical Garden, which just like happened to be on campus. I had no idea that it was there. There had been like this ethnobotanist that was um, who had worked at the University of Georgia in the 80s and the 90s. And he just brought back a lot of the plants that he um, worked with from his studies. And he created this beautiful botanical garden, but after he retired, it kind of, you know, fell by the wayside and nobody took care of it. So that summer I ended up really spending a lot of time kind of using my under my high school experience and like, you know, making the garden beautiful again, but also doing a deep dive into like how these plants are used to kind of to produce educational materials um, for students who are using the garden. And that's really where I kind of fell in love with Caribbean ethnobotany and fell in love with the plants um, in the Caribbean. So towards the end of my undergrad, I had, it was another summer and I applied for an internship and I, I got it this time. And it was right down the road in Atlanta at Emory University. And this was a lot more, it was ethnobotany, but it was more focused on the chemicals that are in these plants and how um, the bioactivity of these plants, so like if they're, if, what, how they're working. And that really scared me. I felt like um, I was not the best chemistry student. And so I knew it was something I was kind of interested in, but I was really intimidated going into that internship. And I ended up, you know, it was a struggle, but I ended up falling in love with that as well. So I feel like from all these different, you know, experiences I had throughout my high school and undergrad, I kind of found my way into doing what I do now. So now what I study is urban ethnobotany, which is the study of how people use plants in cities. And I put a statistic from the United Nations here showing that over half the world's population already lives in cities. And that number is expected to rise significantly in the next few decades. And I think, you know, you know, with this, the talk tonight, we're thinking a lot about climate change and, 
natural disasters, you know, both of those things displacing people. And I really feel like urban ethnobotany covers um, that as well as, you know, how, how are people, you know, adapting to these tough situations, especially when they're, when they are forced to migrate other places or, you know, as they migrate other places. And at the New York Botanical Garden, when my mentor, Dr. Ina Vanderbrook was there, she started this really comprehensive um, Caribbean urban ethnobotany program where she collaborated with lots of different Caribbean immigrant groups in New York City to understand what, what plants were used, people were using as medicine. And she saw some really interesting trends where like people were using more food plants as medicines in New York because that's what's available in grocery stores. And then also knowledge not necessarily being age dependent. So younger immigrants having the same level as, of plant knowledge as older immigrants, which was an interesting finding. And what I really like about my project and what drew me to work with Dr. Vanderbrook and be in this program is it's a way to combine traditional and scientific knowledge to support community health, um, particularly for immigrant groups. And so New York City is kind of like the ideal place <laughs> to do this kind of research. It's the city of immigrants. There's 3.1 million immigrants living in New York City. And like I said, we have this you know, really comprehensive um, Caribbean urban ethnobotany program at the Botanical Garden, where we've worked with lots of different um, Caribbean immigrant groups. And then going back to you know, how, how you can take urban ethnobotany and apply it to support community health. My mentor has developed this CARLO E2 program, which stands for Caribbean and Latino ethnobotany and ethnomedicine. And it takes the data that she's collected from her ethnobotanical surveys in New York. So you know, what plants people are using, what health conditions are relevant, people's you know, beliefs around health and conveys that back to doctors and medical students who have Caribbean and Latino patients in New York so they can provide culturally sensitive care. Um, and so that's, again, the, thinking about why, what drew me to, to work with Dr. Vanderbrook and be in this program was I really like the idea of applied ethnobotany. I like the idea of, you know, not just doing this work and it ends up in an academic paper that no one reads, it's actually making an impact um, and helping people. So on the left side here, I have a table showing the top 10 largest immigrant groups in New York City by population size. And so I've highlighted the Dominican community, which is the largest, and um, also where we focus the majority of our collaboration in the past, and then the Haitian community as well. Um, so we have not collaborated yet, collaborated yet with the Haitian community, even though it's one of the largest um, communities in New York. But um, there's some interesting cross-cultural comparisons that can be made between the Dominican community and the Haitian community. So um, to do a little geography, um, Haiti and the Dominican Republic have something in common. They're both located on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. So Dominican Republic is on the eastern side of the island. Haiti is on the western side. And even though these are two very, very different cultures, um, the plants that grow on the island of Hispaniola grow on either side, regardless of the border. So there's a shared repository of plants that can be used for medicine by both cultures, even if they use the plants differently. And then when people from Haiti and the Dominican Republic come to places like New York City, there's also a shared flora. So there's only a certain, you know, a number of plants that are sold in the markets and these things called botanicas, which are like these Caribbean specialized herbal stores in New York. I have a picture of one in Washington Heights here, um, green grocers and parks. And so really kind of where the question of my project lies is, you know, how do these two very different cultures that have the same plants available in two different places, where, what are the similarities and differences and how they're using medicinal plants for women's health? Oh, and I should also add, so yeah, I think where this is also important is with, with Im immigrant groups in general and healthcare data, a lot of times groups from different, from the same area of the world get lumped together in healthcare data. So I think, you know, also looking at this, these similarities and differences and highlighting that um, is important to support um, the best care for people from these communities. So I kind of wanted to d dive into like, you know, how, how I started this project and what being an ethnobotanist looks like and the kind of data I work with. So to be honest, my project was a little, I had a little bit of a kind of a backwards way of getting into it because, because of COVID happened really early on um, during my PhD. So I was supposed to do my survey first, figure out what plants I wanted to look at in the lab and then do the lab work. But then, you know, I was fortunate. So while I couldn't do the survey, I had all this data from the Dominican community um, in New York City, and then also from an ethnobotanical survey in the Dominican Republic. And then what that data looked like were these use reports. So with every use report, there was a participant code for each participant, the um, demographic information, 
the health condition they reported in Spanish, um, as well as a common name of the plant people were reporting to treat that health condition. And I think, you know, where kind of the detective work as an ethnobotanist comes in is there's, you know, some nuance in how people are, you know, reporting these conditions in Spanish. And so translating that to English is not as straightforward as you would necessarily think it would be. And then the biggest one would be actually kind of matching the common name of the plant to the scientific name. So you're looking at use reports for Agrima mexicana. It goes by prickly poppy. It goes by Cardo Santo. It goes by Chicolote. It goes by Chad Juan. It goes by a million other things as well. There's plants that are, there are other plants that are completely unrelated to this plant that are sold as Cardo Santo. So kind of doing the detective work and figuring out what plant people are actually talking about is really a big part of my job. And I like it because it's a way for me to, you know, have my hands on the plants and learn, learn more about people. But um, it is that that is a large part of being an ethnobotanist. So looking at those use reports, I wanted to figure out, you know, what, what are the most important women's health conditions that people are treating with medicinal plants in New York City in the Dominican community. And so from those, I found that gynecological infections was the top women's health, um, women's health uh, condition treated with medicinal plants, which that included vaginal infections and sexually transmitted infections. I also highlighted feminine cleansing here because it's it's a it came out as a separate condition, but a lot of the plants that are used for feminine cleansing are kind of preventative for gynecological infections and they're applied the same way. So I looped those in for my analysis. And kind of going back into those use reports, um, people also reported, you know, how they were actually using these plants. And I found a lot of the plants that were used for gynecological infections were applied directly to the body for the purpose of cleaning, preventing, and treating infection. And so kind of taking a step back and thinking about this scientifically, you know, what's making these plants medicinal is the compounds that are in these plants. And so, you know, when you're using these plants to treat an infection, you're hoping that the compounds are interacting with whatever harmful bacteria that's causing infection, killing it off, making you infection, you know, getting rid of the infection. The bacteria that I work with that causes infection is Garnella vaginalis. It's a, um, it causes bacterial vaginosis, but that's not the only bacteria that's present in the vagina. Um, there's also the whole of the bacteria that makes up the vaginal microbiota. So you hear a lot about like the gut microbiota, the skin microbiota. There's also the vaginal microbiota. And that's made up of these um, bacterial species. They're mostly lactobacillus that really create this like inhospitable environment that keeps anything that's going to cause infection out. And if you mess up the balance of those species, then you're actually increasing the likelihood of disease rabbit and preventing it. So, you know, people are using these plants, even if it's having, you know, even if it's killing off what's bad, if it's killing off the good stuff as well, then it's going to cause some problems. So, you know, I went back into those use reports, looked for the plants that were being used for these conditions. And I really have ended up focusing my PhD work on Agrima mexicana. Um, so that's that plant I showed earlier. And um, it's a plant that was, you know, used for gynecological infections um, by the Dominican community in New York. I did a literature search um, looking at what's known to be used in um, Haiti for, uh, you know, for plant medicine and found documented use that's being used for vaginal infections in Haiti. So this, I kind of hypothesized that when I do my survey um, with the Haitian community that this plant will come up as part of um, plants used for gynecological infections. And then also, you know, thinking about, you know, I'm going to be trying to finish my PhD at some point. So I wanted it to be some kind of, you know, basis for um, how this plant is used. And there's some really well-known um, plant chemicals that are known to be antibacterial that are in this plant. So that was kind of the basis for me choosing this plant for my PhD work. And what's really interesting about um, this plant in particular, and then I, I found this with some of the other plants I've worked with as well, is there's so many different ways that people are preparing this plant for it to be used. And I've kind of come up come up that with the use reports, but also just from going collecting this plant in New York. So when I go to a Botanica, people either sell it to me dry or I get it fresh. Um, there's also, there's like a brand, uh, uh, like a botanical brand in New York City where it's like pre-processed pre samples where like you can think of it as like a bag of chips or something or somebody, you know, it's pre-packaged, stapled, it's been sitting on the shelf versus sometimes I go in and they give me like a huge bag of bulk material that they have in the freezer in the back. And then just talking to people and looking at the yeast reports, some people say, oh, I put like, you know, a few leaves in the bathtub or I put a whole bag in the bathtub or oh, I put a few leaves in a tea cup and then use that as a wash. So there's so much variety and you know how this plant is used, how this plant is stored in New York City. 
And that really impacts the chemistry of these plants. So that's impacting the compounds that are available to make this plant medicinal. So really kind of where my laboratory study is focused is like, okay, people are preparing this plant all these different ways. How is that impacting how the relationship with this plant and the vaginal microbiota? And so I've kind of seen this already with my laboratory studies. So there have been chemical differences between the processed and the unprocessed samples. So like those bulk samples had differences than the ones that have been prepackaged. My kind of my hypothesis for that is that the prepackaged samples are probably older and they've deteriorated over time. And then doing some of my, my antibacterial testing, I found that only the um, unprocessed or bulk samples had any activity against the pathogenic bacteria or the beneficial bacteria. So there was activity against um, the bacteria that caused bacterial vaginosis. There was also some activity against one of the beneficial species that I tested, but it, the extracts had much more of an impact on the harmful, um, the harmful bacteria. So that's the, that's the optimal situation is that, you know, if people are using this plant, you want, the, you want it to impact the harmful bacteria a whole lot more than the beneficial bacteria. So kind of where I am now is uh, since COVID has gotten a little bit better and I've um, gotten my IRB approval, I'll be starting my ethnobotanical survey with the Haitian community in the next few weeks actually. And so I'll be identifying, you know, more plants that are used for women's health conditions, not just gynecological infections. Then I'm also gonna be doing some, a little bit different lab work where I'm looking kind of the other ways that this plant it could be impacting the body so whether it's impacting human cells negatively or whether there's like other routes that this plant could be attacking the pathogenic bacteria and then finally kind of you know honing in on what what compounds are actually causing um, the antibacterial activity and then seeing how that varies against different tradition or against across different traditional preparations to kind of figure out again that like optimal preparation um, for when people use these plants and so i'd like to acknowledge the Haitian and Dominican communities in New York City. Um, there's also one Botanica in particular that I collaborate a lot with, um, Botanica La 21 Division, as well as my mentors, um, the members of my PhD committee, and then NIH, the um, Garden Club of America, and then the New York Botanical Garden and City University of New York. Um, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, really great um, to hear from you. Um, we're going to hear from our next speaker, Alicia Wallace, and then after that we can do like a moderated panel and any questions and answers as well. Um, so I'm just going to switch the spotlighting really quick. Okay, um, so um, first of all, thank you, Soka, for um, helping us put this together. Really appreciate it. And I am very honored um, to introduce Alicia Wallace. Um, Alicia is a women's rights activist, public educator, movement builder, and writer from the Bahamas. She's the director of Hollaback Bahamas, part of a global movement to end street harassment and uses the platform to run discussions on feminism and gender-based violence and discrimination. She serves as a regional coordinator of Hollowback Caribbean and has designed a safe space training program and designation system for the region. Alicia is also director of Equality Bahamas, which promotes women's rights as human rights. The organization focused primarily on intimate partner violence in 2014 and constitutional equality from 2014 to June 2016, won a constitutional referendum on gender equality and citizenship rights and non-discrimination was held. Um, so we're so excited to have you here. Um, please join me in welcoming Alicia Wallace. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great to be here. One of my favorite things to do in my work is talk to young people and university students because a lot of times the older people kind of suck. <laughs> And they're a lot of work, um, but I like being in spaces where there's like more imagination and more open thought and people are open to 
different kinds of dialogue and, and maybe even changing the ways that we think or have learned to think about various things. Um, so as mentioned, I am from the Bahamas and I run Equality Bahamas right now. So uh, Hollaback Bahamas was a project that I did for a couple of years, um, very focused on street harassment and then sort of put that aside and was hoping to find some new leadership, younger leadership for that, but it didn't quite work out. So now my energy is really on Equality Bahamas. And we started with a very specific focus on domestic violence and intimate partner violence. It started as rapid response. So there was a really stupid comment that was made by a member of parliament about domestic violence. And he stated it like it was a joke, but of course domestic violence is never funny, but everyone in parliament either laughed at it or remained silent. So a group of us were really pissed off and decided we were gonna take some actions. We did that as a coalition. And then eventually that coalition transitioned into what is now Equality Bahamas, which is completely volunteer run and grassroots. And as issues came up and we sort of tapped into different networks and different realities, we started to expand our work beyond domestic violence. So then we included discrimination and then we started working on constitutional reform because this referendum came up um, to address the issue of inequality in citizenship. So women don't pass on citizenship in the same way as men in the Bahamas. So that was a really big issue that we worked on for two years. Um, no success there yet. We had the referendum and everyone voted, well, most people voted no. So we didn't get to make that change. And since then we've expanded to look at gender-based violence more broadly, getting that understanding that gender-based violence is not just intimate partner violence or domestic violence, but it's also structural violence. And that's a space that we put a lot of energy because there really aren't many people talking about structural violence. We're not really having that many conversations about systems and institutions and how they cause us harm and they cause disproportionate harm to women and LGBTQI plus people in particular. So we're looking at things like the law. So in the Bahamas right now, we're looking at the Sexual Offenses Act, which defines rape, but excludes married people. So it means that it's not illegal to rape your spouse. So we started looking at things like that. And over the years, it's just grown. <laughs> our, we, we started to spread ourselves pretty thin, I think, um, especially for a small group of, of volunteers. And in the Bahamas, we are, of course, very susceptible to climate events. We have hurricanes on a pretty regular basis. You can't really predict them, um, but there are certain ways that we can kind of tell that a hurricane might be coming that year. So there are a couple of things that we look for, like um, poinciana trees. Sometimes we see signs in the bloom. So if their blooms are really large and really beautiful and um, all across the island, it's sort of a sign that, oh boy, there, there's probably gonna be a hurricane this year. Um, and given all the hurricanes, we started doing drives following hurricanes, particularly to collect menstrual hygiene products. So we would call for pads and tampons, especially, um, but also baby items. And that was sort of a norm because after a storm, you know, there are all these drives, people are bringing clothes and all this stuff, but no one is thinking about the needs of menstruating people. No one's thinking about the needs of parents and their babies. So that was something that we focused on. And then things sort of took a turn in 2019, September, we got this horrific category five storm, Hurricane Dorian, that just sat on a couple of our islands, Grand Bahama and Abaco to the north got, I mean, it was, it was horrible. They really got decimated. There were people who had to go up to the second story of their homes and still didn't know if they would survive the rising water. The ocean literally went on the land. People had to swim to safety in the, in the eye of the storm. Um, and it displaced thousands and thousands of people from their home islands to New Providence, where the capital of Nassau is. So if and a lot of people just have this vague idea of the Bahamas, but it's an archipelago. So it's lots of islands just sort of sprinkled um, south of Florida. And it's, it's really a challenge because we haven't decentralized government. So the administration of the government, and we also haven't decentralized resources and services. So it means that people constantly have to travel to New Providence where the capital is to get shit done. It means that um, members of parliament, even if they're representing 
what we call the family islands. So islands that are not New Providence or Grand Bahama, which is the second city. Um, they have to travel to New Providence for par parliament meetings and for cabinet meetings and things like that. So everything is very, very Nassau centric, we would say. And the displacement of people from Grand Bahama and Abaco to New Providence was, I'm sure disorienting for a lot of them who have never lived in New Providence or perhaps only spent a couple days there when they needed to you know, renew a document or um, get a particular service that's not available on their home islands, like perhaps mammograms. So yeah, people have to travel to get mammograms because there aren't mammogram machines on all of the islands, it's, it's things like that. And when that storm happened, I sort of knew right away that we can't just do the usual menstrual hygiene product drive. That would just be, it would be a drop in the bucket. It would be helpful, but a drop in the bucket. Let me think about ways that we can expand. So I talked to a contact um, at Lendahan Bahamas, which is another great NGO doing amazing work, particularly with young people in one of the inner city communities. And they were happy to partner. Um, I contacted another friend that at, um, she was then the executive director at the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. And she talked to the staff and the full team there and they were all incredible, very welcoming and actually allowed us to set up a hurricane uh, donation center inside the gallery. So you can imagine the National Art Gallery, all this art everywhere. And they gave us the space inside the gallery to stack up boxes and bins and have people in and out bringing donations. And then very quickly, it also turned into a distribution center. So people found out that we had stuff and they started coming to collect them, obviously, instead of going to these other centers that were just clogged with long lines and lots, lots of bureaucracy and red tape and asking them for all kinds of proof that they're actually from the island that they say they're from. And hearing the stories of people that came to us for help really clued us into what these systems look like. Because you would think in the aftermath of a disaster that the priority is to get people help. The priority is to make sure that people have their needs met and that they're assisted in the long term for rebuilding their entire lives. It's not just about homes. You know, it's about, it's about um, get, maintaining their dignity. It's about um, rebuilding businesses, maybe getting new jobs or starting their own thing. Um, it's about taking care of their mental health. You know, it's so much more than just you need to rebuild your home or here's some, some clothes and some food to eat. And it's really, um, it pushed us to think about the deficiencies of systems. And I think we often think about the government as really bad at doing its job, really bad at taking care of people. And we think of NGOs as quite excellent at it, at filling in that gap. But what we saw was that all NGOs are not created equal. They're not built the same. They do not serve people the same. And some of them practice the same shit that governments do. And so people were getting turned away because they couldn't produce ID or people were being given less because you know they had just been there last week and kind of things like that happening. And then we started to notice over a few weeks that we were getting lots of migrant people coming to us. So lots of people of Haitian descent who've been living in the Bahamas for a long time. Um, there are pretty large um, um, settlements of um, Haitian people in Abaco in particular. And so many of them were displaced, um, particularly those that were living in shanty towns, so sort of the, um, what do you call them? I guess like unofficial housing areas um, that didn't necessarily have all of the utilities and, and weren't you know, following the building code and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so they were kind of discarded. You know, you weren't supposed to be here anyway. Their, their, um, what was left of their homes was kind of bulldozed. Fences were put up so that they couldn't access them. So this is the way that we're treating people who have just gone through a disaster and fought in many cases to survive and, and try to save loved ones that maybe weren't able to do that. Um, we still don't know the death toll. And we'll never know the death toll because you know, all of the bodies were not recovered. All of the people were not identified, but our focus was really on making sure that we were serving the underserved and that we were centering the people that we were trying to help and making sure that we weren't just going through the motions of, look at us, we have these food packages, awesome. We're passing it out to everybody. We're so great, woohoo, you know? But talking to people, finding out 
what their specific needs were. And so not digging for the hot gossip about what they went through and trying to listen to their, or, or dig, dig out their harrowing stories, but paying attention to what their lives were like, what their lives were like in that state post or you know, in the midst of disaster and what they were trying to do going forward. And that helped us to figure out what we needed to do. So as an example, there were lots of different shelters set up and Haitian people were primarily put in a certain set of shelters and some of them were Haitian churches. And um, they were being provided with, with meals like from various different entities, you know, sometimes. And somebody had this brilliant idea, let's provide breakfast. So that's great, let's do that. A couple of days a week for a few weeks. Um, so we partnered with some other great folks that got their sort of um, church communities, church women involved in cooking these giant pots of, of grits in the Bahamas. We love grits for breakfast, grits with corned beef, grits with tuna, grits with eggs, grits with sardines, like grits, 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 we love it. And we eat a lot of like American breakfast too. So like your, your eggs and bacon, your eggs and sausage kind of thing as well. So we were providing this breakfast and in a conversation with someone at the shelter, we were like, so is there anything else that we can do to help you to make things a little bit nicer for you? Because we know that we're meeting the basic needs. You have water, you have food, you have shelter, but there are often things beyond that that would help you feel a little bit more like yourself, a little bit more human, um, build back some, um, some dignity and, and self-determination and things like that. And one of the things that they said was that they would really like to have a Haitian breakfast. You know, like the Bahamian breakfast is nice, the eggs and bacon is nice, but that's not what we eat for breakfast usually. And it would be really nice to have the things that we're used to eating. So, and it was just like a really kind of moment, you know, just like forehead smack, like 10 times in succession, because obviously people want to eat what they're used to eating. Why aren't we thinking about culturally relevant relief, not just the bare minimum or the thing that's easiest to us or the thing that comes to mind. And it was a really good reminder for us that it's not easy to work from a feminist perspective or use feminist approaches. Um, and it has to be something that we do with intention. And when I talk about feminist approaches and I talk about feminist policy making, I'm talking about centering the people who you're supposed to be serving. Centering in particular, the people who are in situations of vulnerability, the people who are at the highest risk of being harmed or left behind. So in the situation of a disaster, of course, we're looking at the people who are directly impacted. That's a huge group of people. And then if we wanna to get to the most vulnerable people, we're gonna to start to kind of peel back layers and figure out, okay, so we have some people who are directly impacted, who have family members who can take them in and take them in for a long period of time. Right, so they're not the most vulnerable. They're not super comfortable, but they're not the most vulnerable. If we wanna go for the most vulnerable, we're thinking about the people who don't have family members and friends, the people who don't really have those sort of long running ties to the country, much less New Providence where they've been displaced to with people who can take them in. That's gonna be migrant people who don't have those kinds of like Bahamian roots as we like to call them. Why aren't we thinking about them in particular? And of course, we wanna think about women why? Because women are disproportionately impacted by crises for many different reasons. Women don't have um, the same income. There's a wage gap that's preventing women from earning the same amount of money as men. Um, women are often um, survivors, victims of violence, and that worsens when there's crisis and when you have to share space with more family members and things like that. Um, Women are the holders of knowledge of their household. So we saw within our, our center that it was primarily women coming in. I would say 97% of the people who came in were women. And these women knew everything about their households and everything about their family members and what each person needed. The burden is primarily on women to figure out how to get out of the crisis and how to make sure that everyone survives and is comfortable throughout the duration of that movement from crisis mode into some sense of normalcy. So our work has always centered women we had to do it in a new way and think about um, the specific groups of women that needed our attention. So women who were LBTQ people who didn't have families who were willing to take them in. Women who were migrants who also don't have family to take them in. Women who are um, receiving low incomes or unemployed or newly unemployed because you know wherever they worked has been washed away. So peeling back these layers, thinking really specifically about the groups of people that we want to help 
and actually talking to them about it and not deciding what they need. Because we could decide that, you know, you need to get a job. So we're going to give you three pairs of black pants, some tops, some blazers, some high heels. At the moment, they're like living, sitting on the couch, sleeping on the couch at their cousin's house. If they need flip flops, they need some food items to take so they can feel like, and their people who are taking them in can feel like they're contributing to the household. You know, it's a, a completely new way of thinking and you can't do it yourself. You have to center people. You have to involve them in their own relief, in their own assistance and figuring out what the resources and services are that they need. Um, so that was a, a learning curve for us. And it was also a moment of recognizing that as an organization that's you know feminist and that's focused on women, on LGBTQ plus people and other people in situations of vulnerability, we don't have the luxury of deciding that we're not gonna venture into a particular space because we don't have the expertise or we don't have the time to learn about it. So for me, I've always been really afraid of science. So listening to Ella was just like, Ooh, child, I don't know. <laughs> I know about like plants looking nice and I know that we use what we call bush medicine. So we use plants for medicine as well, but all of the like biology and I'm just like, I don't know. So I've stayed away from conversations about climate, about environment, because I just felt inept. But that moment, September, 2019, Hurricane Dorian really showed me and my entire team that we don't have that luxury if we're going to serve um, women in the Bahamas and other vulnerable groups, because these things are intersecting. There's no way to separate gender from climate because they're, they're connected and your identity determines how you are impacted by a particular event or by a set of systems um, and how you need and access and use a set of resources and services um, who provides them, why they provide them and what they expect of you when they do provide them. And I feel like I've been talking for a long time and I know that a lot of the value in these events is actually being able to have conversation and ask questions and challenge people and stuff like that. So I'm going to stop. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was awesome. It was so amazing to hear more about your work. Um, everyone at this event, please start putting your questions in the chat um, so we can read them out for a moderated Q&A. Um, but we as event organizers had a couple of questions that we would just love to explore more. Um, one thing we would love to talk more about is um, what is like the role of community in your work or how would you even define community? I can start if you, okay. if you want. Oh, I didn't know if, which, who that was directed towards, but. <laughs> oh yeah, all the questions are for everyone. Okay, so well, Alicia, you wanna start and then I'll, I'll tag along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So community for me, and for all of us at Equality of Bahamas is, is so many different things. It's, it's the beginning, it's the middle and the end, right? So it's the place that we start. That's where we find out what we're doing and who we're doing it for and how, how we need to do it to best serve those people. Community is also the method. It's, it's how we figure out our how, you know? So we get the what from the community, but we also work with them to figure out the how. And then to the end, or because I mean, I don't want to talk about the end like it's a definitive point because it's not like even the end is sort of a process, but community is also the way that we um, test our models, the way that we um, access data, how we get the evidence, how we measure the impact and how we figure out what we need to do moving forward. So like community is all of the work that we do. It's not just this little component or the people that we serve. The community has to be involved in it. They have to be the beginning, the middle and the end, and they have to be at the center of everything. And I, I mean, I feel like that also applies with my work as well. I, you know, when I, from the work that I, that my mentors conducted with, you know, different immigrant communities in New York City, and then, you know, kind of preparing to do my work in New York City is the groups that we're working with are really tight knit community communities. And I really, I think something that I've been really conscious of, and I've been, you know, consulting people on my committee, um, I, there's, I have a woman uh, who's a nursing professor at York College at the University of New York, and she's like part of the Haitian Studies Institute, really thinking about, okay, how can I, how, how can I truly make this a collaboration with the Haitian community? How can I do the things that are actually going to benefit the community? So that really spoke to me, Alicia, when you were talking about, you know, peeling back the layers and actually, because I feel like, you know, sometimes as a scientist, you're like, oh, well, everybody's going to appreciate all this data that I did and all this, all these experiments, but that's not, 
that's not the point. It's like, you need to be doing things that are actually going to benefit the people that you're collaborating with and it really truly be a collaboration. Thank you so much for sharing your response to that. There, we're getting a ton of great questions in the chat. Um, so I'd love to turn it over to the audience. One of our first questions is, what was the most significant thing um, that you needed to unlearn during your work? So this was um, directed at Alicia, but both of you are welcome to answer. Ooh, unlearn. <laughs> so many things. I think um, in many ways that that we know the answer to everything. Because um, you, you kind of have that idea, as particularly if people are in need, there's this sort of sense that, oh, I know exactly what they need. Um, they're going to need food, they're going to need water, they're going to want this, and they're going to be really excited if we give them this thing. Um, so I think thinking through more than just the basics, but actually putting yourself in a very specific circumstance can help. Um, so it's thinking beyond um, this whole group of people have, has just survived a disaster, narrowing it down even to um, a young unmarried woman as a newborn baby and is now displaced and doesn't know where she's gonna go. Like that, that's a way more, focused approach um, to help to figure out the, the realities of somebody's need. Um, and also I think connected to that is this idea that, you know, to ask people what they need is um, a drain on them. Um, and, and, you know, in some cases it can be, but there are ways to do needs assessments. Um, like I said, for us, it was pretty easy to do because it was kind of a, a comfortable environment. So people kind of went around and looked to see what they needed. And we could kind of talk to them and say, is there anything else that you need? Is there anything that we're not providing that would be helpful for you? Because we can get it in. So it's not mining for information, but it is um, letting them know that there are other ways and there are more options and that we're open to hearing from them. And then I feel like um, with my field, I, there's been a lot I, I mean, I could go all into this, but there's been a lot of like upheaval in ethnobotany in the last, like de I would say the last couple of decades where we've really been focusing on decolonizing ethnobotany because of what Alicia was talking about, all these structures that are in place, but especially in, acad well, in an academia that's harmful to the people that we work with and harmful for, you know, people who are working in academia as well. And so I feel like, you know, through you know, through being an ethnobotanist, it's been a process of learning and unlearning all the time. You know, I, I grew up in Georgia, I grew up in like a, you know, small town in the South. So it's been even just moving to New York City and being, you know, I, being exposed to different people, it's been a process of learning and unlearning. Um, and I feel like that's also as an ethnobotanist, it's kind of the kind of the best part of the job, I feel like actually is just like, you know, kind of challenging yourself and being able to listen to people and, you know, really, yeah, go, go for this process of, again, learning and unlearning. Next question I'm seeing is from Victoria. So how do local organizations serve local populations and in more effective ways than larger international NGOs? Oh, there's, <laughs> there's so much that I can say about that. Um, I think international NGOs kind of swoop in <laughs> with whatever, and they don't think about the unintended consequences of their help. And they actually need us, the local NGOs, to guide their assistance, or they end up what I, doing what I was just talking about, mining for information and putting a lot of burden on the people that they say that they want to help. Whereas NGOs are already connected to communities, know who was in situations of vulnerability before the thing happened, um, know what the resources are that are available, um, what can be expected or not expected from the government, things like that. And also most of us that are smaller are way more nimble. So we're able to adapt very quickly. So that example that I gave about the breakfast, that was something that could change like in a day <laughs> because we're small, we're not buying these things in bulk. And um, one of the things that really got on my nerves in that last hurricane was that NGOs would send all this water and yes, we need water, but can we think about better ways to send water? We just had a climate disaster that's partially due to pollution and plastics. And you're sending us thousands upon thousands of bottles, single use bottles of water. 
there has to be a better way to do this? Can we think about like life straws? Can we think about better ways that we can actually filter the water that we have? Can you send water bladders? They're not thinking about the knock-on effects and they're also not making space or making opportunities available for us to be able to send that trash back. So yeah, send us the plastic water bottles but when they're empty, you need to take them back home with you. Alex, do you have any thoughts on that that you wanted to share? Or should I move on to the next question? Oh, I think Alicia covered it. <laughs> okay, yeah. perfect. So the next question is from Sophia. So how do you center the people you are trying to help without putting any extra burden on them to educate you? Sorry, I feel yes. like you already touched on this after I asked the question. So if you want to move on, you can. <laughs> Okay, yeah, happy to move on to the next question then. Okay, so this one I think might be a group of questions. So this says, Alicia, you mentioned that there are some traditional ways that people from the Bahamas can predict hurricanes are coming, such as plants blooming. Are there other ways that communities in the Bahamas predict disasters? Do Haitian migrants know about these plants or this kind of knowledge? I'm thinking about the many ways that certain groups may have an easier time preparing for and managing disasters. Yeah, I think a lot of these sort of hints and clues aren't widely known even among Bahamians. Um, a lot of them are sort of brushed off as like old wives tales um, or superstitions, um, but pretty much everything has a root and some, some truth and we've seen them proven. So it's, it's still not something that's a widespread belief or that has been necessarily proven. So I'm not sure that it's a known thing within migrant communities, but I think that all of us in the region and the Caribbean have different um, understandings of the signs in nature. Um, just like we all have uses of, of medicinal plants and bush medicine, and we, we go by you know, different names in some places they might call it, you know, in Haiti, they might refer to it as voodoo. You know, in the Bahamas, they refer to it as obe or witchcraft. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons that there's some resistance to some of this um, ancestral knowledge that we have. It's being, it's being seen as some sort of taboo. So it's a difficult thing to really nail down and actually um, teach people and acknowledge. It's not really being treated as knowledge is what I'm trying to say. I do think that comes into like my work. It's like, that's, that's my goal is that it, it is treated as knowledge and it's, you know, it's, I mean, I, I feel like sometimes I, I don't like this word is like, there's a, a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm trying to validate traditional knowledge and I validate, but also just, you know, it doesn't, I feel like sometimes that comes along with the laboratory experiments. Like even if my, even if my experiments didn't show like this plant is active, it's still important for people. Like it's still like culturally important. And so it's a part of people's like cultures in their lives. So it's, it's not so much about validating, but just, you know, kind of raising up those traditional um, medicines is something that's important for people's cultures. And I will say, like, you know, from my conversations I've had, um, particularly with my, uh, one of my community members about, um, about like tr traditional medicine in Haiti, and I'm sure this is the same throughout the Caribbean, is it's such a, I mean, it, I feel like, you know, in the face of natural disasters and everything, it's not just like a way to kind of like supplement and like help with, you know, disparities in healthcare, but it's such a, it's such a, uh, uh, a sign of resilience. It's like a, it's, it shows, it's part of the culture. It's showing the culture is resilient against these things as well. And so it's kind of a, it's a point of pride and a proud point. And those practices actually go back to, you know, when we were in our home on the continent of Africa. And, Absolutely, um, yeah. <laughs> these were practices that were taught that were passed down during times of slavery as well. And it gave women a way to control their bodies to prevent you know, pregnancies if they didn't want mm -hmm. to bring more children into that kind of, of lifestyle. You know? So it was seen as a bad thing because of course enslaved, <laughs> enslaved people were using it to their you know, advantage, call it that, but to give them some control mm -hmm. and um, the enslavers, of course, don't don't like that, so they're going to give it this sort of negative tint. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, and then going into the realm of like you know um, traditional medicine for women's health, like you're talking about, that 
reminds me it's just I mean going through the like going for the literature and like actually trying to pick out like what's used for women's health it does not exist because people don't people don't want to talk about what's used for women's health or they think it's like a, you know it's bad or even not to so somehow we are almost up on the hour this has really flown by um, I've had so much fun hearing from both of you one question I had um, that I would love for both of you to speak on is what can we do as like students and individuals really like outside of the communities that both of you work in to support your efforts or learn more about what you do or even like take action um, to fight the things you shared tonight? Um, I do, one thing that I really like about my, because I have also, I teach, I teach at Lehman College in the Bronx and I, Lehman's like a super diverse um, university. I have students from all over the world and I, what I really like about what I do and then also teaching is like, I, well, I tell people about what I do and, and then students are like, oh, well, let me tell you about this plant that like, you know, my mom uses or, you know, so I think just, I think talking to people, um, honestly, is like kind of the biggest thing and listening to people about their cultures and their traditions. I think for, for me, I would say going beyond amplifying voices. <laughs> just like all well and good right like sure like our posts and share them and stuff but also think about your position and the power that you have I think we have really limiting views of power so think more creatively about that and about the spaces that you're in and the people that you have access to and understand that as a power as well and, and your ability to influence and you know wherever you see power don't be afraid don't wait for permission to take it and shake it and remake it and redistribute it because that's really what we need to redistribute power. And we need to really challenge the people who are in decision-making positions to do, do things differently and take a feminist approach to the work that they're doing. And they're only gonna do that if they're under pressure. And, that, and that's a power that we all have to do. That is such an awesome note to end on. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time tonight. Alicia, Ella, this was fantastic. Um, huge shout out again to students of the Caribbean Association um, for putting this event together. Um, I learned so much from it and I hope all of you did as well. Um, so if no one else has final thoughts, um, thank you so much and have a great rest of the evening.